Hey there, 8th graders. Uh, this is Mr. Rogers, and we are doing uh, a screencast for um, our investigation of the Drake equation and SETI. Uh, the, the presentation is called Are We Alone? There is a graphic organizer that you can download uh, and put into Notability, and you can fill in uh, kind of the guided notes as you go along. Um, so this is here for anyone who might have missed out and um, not had um, the benefit of, of hearing some of this information. So, um, you know, the whole idea is that we're investigating this because it really does fit back to the essential question about whether or not you matter to the universe. You know, whether or not uh, there's other life out there could mean a big difference. So, imagine if I gave you this assignment and I said, your job is to go out and find out what are the chances of intelligent life out there in the universe. Uh, and that was your homework assignment tonight. Uh, it might feel a little overwhelming at first, um, but luckily someone's done some of that work already. Uh, a person by the name of Drake, uh, and what he did is he used math to make um, a guess about how many intelligent alien civilizations could exist in the universe. And that's the thing to remember. This is a guess, just like a lot of other guesses. But the one thing that Drake had going for them is him is that he was thinking really scientifically about it, and he wanted to make the guess as good as it possibly could be. Uh, so he didn't want to just take wild, wild guesses. He wanted to actually um, make the guesses close to what the reality is. So how did he do it? So the first part here is that he started by trying to figure out how many stars there are in our galaxy. Um, and on the low end, the number is about 200 billion. In the Milky Way galaxy, we would be one of those stars, our sun, out of the 200 billion. Uh, and Drake always wanted to guess low because he figured if he guessed low and he was wrong, then the number of alien civilizations actually would rise and be larger. Uh, and he figured that would be less depressing than guessing too high and finding out he was wrong and having there be less life. So once you have the number of stars in the Milky Way galaxy, the next obvious thing to tackle would be the number of planets that would be going around each star. So, you know, keep our own solar system in mind. We have eight major planets. We have well over a hundred moons, and a moon could uh, harbor life just as easily as a planet could. There's nothing magical about a planet versus a moon other than the right conditions. And of course, we have hundreds of dwarf planets floating around out there. So when you think about our solar system, there are literally hundreds of worlds. So that gives you an increased chance for life. Uh, but again, Drake wanted to guess low. So he guessed an average of only 10 worlds per solar system. Uh, which, when you consider we have several hundred, ten is a pretty small number. But again, that's the whole point, is that you want this to be um, as close to uh, a low end as possible so that you can get a pretty stable number here. So, how do you figure out the number of planets that should be in our galaxy? You take 200 billion and do a little bit of math. You're going to multiply it by 10 because you want 10 planets for each of those stars. Uh, the nice thing about 10 is you don't really need a calculator. Any number times 10, you just add a zero. So the no total number of planets that we estimate in the Milky Way galaxy would be 2 billion. But out of that 2 billion, does that mean that every single planet out of the 2 billion will have life on it? Uh, and of course the answer obviously is no. Uh, like in this picture right here, there are going to be some planets that are going to be too close to the sun, some that are going to be further away. Uh, some will have the right kind of atmosphere, some won't. Uh, this, by the way, this green zone is known as the Goldilocks zone, uh, the habitable zone. And each solar system has one, uh, depending on how bright and hot the star is. The distance might, you know, vary. Um, and in our own solar system, this diagram is a little misleading, because in our own solar system, we actually have three planets in the habitable zone, in the Goldilocks zone, Venus and Earth and Mars. The problem with Venus and Mars is their atmospheres are just a little off. But think about all the moons out there as well. Uh, you know, we know that Mars definitely had water flowing on it, evidence of oxygen. That's a strong indication of bacteria. Um, we have moons like Europa uh, and Enceladus, which show evidence of liquid water underneath the ice crust. Uh, and that certainly would give you the right kind of conditions. So this is what Drake finally landed on. He said, OK, if you have 10 planets in a solar system uh, or 10 worlds, he said, out of all that, you might get two out of the 10 that would actually have life. And he said the other eight, you're just going to, or actually he just said the right conditions. The other eight you just throw out as being too hot, too cold, not the right kind of planet. Um, so you're going to need to do a little bit of math again. Um, and this time we're going to take the total number of planets, 2 billion or 2 trillion that we're estimating, 
And this time we're dividing because we want 2 out of every 10. Uh, now, you might be tempted to divide this by 2, but that would be wrong. You want to divide it by 5 instead because 2 over 10 is the same as 1 over 5. Uh, so this is 1 fifth of the planet. So you need to divide by 5. And a nice little thing is you can cheat a little bit and <clears throat> you can cross out all these zeros. There's like 11 of them here. Cross them out and you just have 20 divided by 5, which I think we can all do in our head. That's 4. So guess what we do with the other 11 zeros that we just ignored? Just throw them back on. So now we have 400 billion planets which have the right conditions for life. Okay? But that doesn't mean that they're all going to have life. You know, that you might still end up with a Mars situation or a Venus situation where the conditions were right maybe at the beginning, but not now. So we need to whittle the, the, the planet number down a little bit more. So Drake decided to say that out of all the planets that actually had the right conditions, only uh, one-third of them actually would end up with life. So the other two-thirds uh, he threw out. And so if we do a little bit of math, <clears throat> 400 billion. If we want a third, then we need to divide by 3 this time. If we cover up the zeros like we did the last time, 4 divided by 3 is not quite as easy as 20 or 40 divided by 5 or whatever that the previous number was, 20 divided by 5, I guess. Um, but you could still do it. 4 divided by 3 is 1 and 1 third, or 1.3 repeating. So if we drop all the zeros back in, that would be about 130 billion planets that actually do have life on them. And again, we're trying to lowball this. We're trying to do a low estimate. Um, but, you know, having um, life doesn't necessarily mean that it's intelligent life. Like, you could have semi-intelligent life versus intelligent life. And Drake even kind of struggled. How do you define what's intelligent life? I mean, obviously, you could say bacteria are not intelligent life forms. But what about a cave person? Um, were we intelligent once we had discovered fire or the wheel or agriculture or art or language or an alphabet, um, uh, domesticating animals? Uh, ultimately, what Drake decided is he said, okay, if you're going to be an advanced intelligent civilization, it doesn't do you much good if you can't communicate with them. So he, he set the bar here. He said, you have to at least be able to have radio technology. If you have radio technology, then you're advanced enough to be considered an intelligent civilization, which means humanity has been intelligent for a little more than 100 years. So now... Drake said, okay, out of every 100 planets that actually does have life, only one will end up having intelligent life. Incredibly low amount. 99 will just have regular, like, low levels of, of life, and then one out of the 100 will end up having intelligent life. So we need to get 1 one hundredth this time, or divide by 100, which actually isn't that hard. Any number divided by 100, you just drop off two of the zeros. And this is a very significant number right here. 1,300,000,000 intelligent alien civilizations in our galaxy. That's not aliens, that's planets with aliens. Um, and the really crazy part is, if you recall the number we started with, uh, 2 trillion, if you took this number here, 1,300,000,000, and divided it by 2 trillion, the total number of planets, and then just multiply it by 100 to turn it into a percentage, the percentage is insanely small. This represents 0.06% of all of the planets in the universe or in our galaxy. So 0.06%, that's not even half of a percent. It's way below half a percent, not even 1%. So it just we this is so lowballed here. If if we have even just half a percent or 1%, these numbers are going to skyrocket. Uh, but at any rate, he ended up guessing like a 0.06%. Uh, so the vast majority of stars out there actually won't have intelligent life and a very small will. And even with that, that number's huge. But now consider, that's just one galaxy, ours, the Milky Way. What about all of the other galaxies out there? Astronomers currently estimate that there are 20 billion galaxies in our universe. So if you do the math, that means 20 billion galaxies. If each of them had 1.3 billion alien civilizations, oh my gosh, that's a lot of zeros. Or put another way, that's 26 quintillion alien civilizations in the entire universe. That's 2.6 times 10 to the 19th power. Uh, uh, that's a huge number. And yet it represents an incredibly small amount of the total planets that are out there. So when you think about it, that's just a cute little funny cartoon there. Uh, when you think about it here, 
what we need to really uh, consider is if the universe is, is busting at the seams with intelligent life, then how do we contact them? You know, how, how do we actually connect? And some things to keep in mind is travel time here. Alpha Centauri is four light years away from the Earth. Uh, and in a, so if we could travel at the speed of light, it'd take us four years to get there. But our technology isn't nearly that, that advanced. So it would take us hundreds of thousands of years to reach Alpha Centauri. To get to the opposite side of the Milky Way would take us, that's like uh, 100,000 light years. To get to just nearby galaxies, the closest ones to us would be 200,000 light years across or towards it, excuse me, or 2 million light years away. And if you want to get to the edge of the known universe, you're talking about 15 to 20 billion light years. And we don't even really know the full edge of the universe yet. So traveling to these places doesn't make sense. Trying to send a probe doesn't make sense because hundreds of thousands of years later, it, the probe's not going to work. Uh, and even if you, the probe could work, and that's the closest star, you have to wait 100,000 years just to get to the closest star. And again, our chances are 0.06%. So the chances are overwhelming that Alpha Centauri probably doesn't have intelligent life. Uh, we need to, to visit hundreds, thousands of worlds before we find them. So how about sending a message? Unfortunately, that's difficult too because, because of the, 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 the needle in the haystack uh, problem that we have here. All of those stars and having to wait all those years. For Alpha Centauri, you'd have to wait four years for it to get there, four years for the signal to get back. So what, you wait maybe 10 years just to be safe? And that's one star. So it's just not feasible. But you could listen for radio signals. See, we've been broadcasting radio and television signals around the, the planet for the last 100 years, if you include the, the radio waves. And so we've been broadcasting. Any planet within 100 light years of us should be picking up our transmissions. So let's try listening to other stars to see if they have transmissions. It's a cool idea. It's known as SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. Uh, and it was started in the 70s. It's um, totally funded by um, private uh, folks who donate money. Uh, and the person who founded SETI is good old Carl Sagan. I knew you guys would be surprised by that. And then just to wrap up, there's some things to consider here. Um, what radio frequency should you use? Because there are hundreds of radio frequencies. So you're going to have to scan all of them if you want to hit the right signal. What area of the sky should we be looking at? Um, what if we're pointing towards the south and the signal is coming from a star towards the north? Uh, so we got we to canvas the whole sky. Will our own radio signals drown out extraterrestrial signals? You know, a satellite going overhead could be mistaken as an alien signal. And it's cut off down here, but just the huge ocean of data that we've recorded and trying to figure it out. And I'll just wrap up with this idea. There's this cool thing called SETI at home. And the SETI folks have created a screensaver that individuals can download. And while their computer is running a screensaver, it's receiving a packet of data from SETI. And then the, your computer will um, analyze it for a pattern. And then once it's done with that packet of data, it sends it back to SETI. And then SETI sends you a new one. And it just runs in the background while your screensaver is going. So it's kind of cool because if a million people are running the screensaver, that means you have a million more computers that are accessing the data and searching for a signal. So that needle in the haystack, at least the odds become a little bit better. All right, so I know that was quick. Um, hopefully it got you everything that you needed. And if you missed some of the presentation, it's all right there for you, and you can fill in your graphic organizer. So uh, wish you luck, and we'll see you back in class.